she 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 built sorry um she built collaborative relationship between the groups in conflict and she also dedicated the past decade to facilitating support groups coaching individuals promoting awareness and creating dialogue around conflict and holistic approaches towards resolving conflict and with that said i'd like to welcome alena to the floor to give us some of the insights on how we should approach conflict in future so alena welcome and kindly before before you take the floor alena can you can you um help me pronounce your your last name <laughs> thank you so much for this warm introduction uh my last name is pronounced astashankava I know it looks a bit overwhelming with all the letters, but it just sounds like it's spelled. So oh. thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen with you. Can everybody see it? Is that working? Yes. So I'll take that as a yes. Um, sorry. I see. We can't see the screen. You cannot see my screen. Yes. Try that again. There we go. Now that's better. And here we are. Technology is yeah. a little slow in my end today. There we go. Okay, much better. So it is it is an honor and it is a pleasure to be here with you today. And what I'd like to share is my knowledge and uh, my learnings on the inside approach to conflict as a way of using it for conflict transformation. And I'm a conflict coach and facilitator specializing in the inside approach. In this session, we don't have much time together and it's a very deep topic. So what I'd like to cover for our first time is the roots. What is inside approach? Where did it come from? Um, what tools can you use uh, to gain insights? And tools is the curiosity. Um, I'd like to talk about some of the practical application and also throughout this presentation, and you're welcome to the copy of this PowerPoint. There are links and resources that you can find uh, if you want to find out more information about a particular subject. So uh, without further ado, so what is inside approach? Well, an inside approach is a way of understanding parties and conflict, and it is a method. It is a method of conflict resolution. Um, it's not a quick solution. It is a method that uses progressive and cumulative uh, efforts towards peace building. This method originated from the philosophical origins of Canadian philosopher Bernard Lonergan, and he wrote a lot on theology, and two of his key works that are used in Insight are Insight's The Study of Human Understanding, so really how do humans understand, and the, when do they gain insights that deepen their understanding, and a method in theology where he talked about having a method towards the work, towards the work that helps parties break a cycle. So it's a collaborative uh, work that brings people and approaches together towards peace building. And this was taken further. So this uh, philosophy was applied by these practitioners and uh, academics pictured here in the center. We've got Dr. Cheryl Picard. She is the insight mediator who, who found her practice to be really good at creating peace in the room. And she collaborated to her left is Dr. Kenneth Melkin, and uh, to her right is Dr. Jamie Price. So the collaboration led them to a number of academic research and writing on what made the practice successful, how can conflict be transformed through insights. And their goal was to find out how that to discover um, an answer to that conflict can't be resolved and peacemaking can't be carried out unless parties they deepen their insights into their own feelings of what they feel is threatened and what it is that they truly care about in conflict 
that tends to lock them in conflict with each other. And unless these parties can grasp new insights about the conflict that they're locked in, that these insights can make it possible for them to, to change their understanding of the threats. Um, a quick example would be my son slammed the door. He used to slam the door every time I'd say no to video games. And I thought that he was slamming it as a, as a showing of his displeasure with, uh, with me saying no. So the threat that I experienced was a threat to our relationship. I thought you're going to be one of those teenagers that, you know, slams the doors and does, you know, goes off and goes quiet. And I didn't want that. So what I thought was threatened was our relationship, our future relationship. My defense response initially was to go and to say, no, you can't do that. This is forbidden. But then that just locked us into he slams, I yell, he slams, I yell. Getting an insight into, well, what does it matter? What really matters? A relationship. Okay, what kind of relationship do I want? I want an open relationship. When I understood myself, I was open to understand my son. And when I used inside approach, we'll, I'll discuss a bit more later, in understanding him, we both found a new way of collaborating and working through these um, through these issues. So this is what these academics and practitioners are writing about in their inside mediation writings and their conflict uh, through insight is how this method in peacemaking is rooted in research and rooted in philosophy, yet has a very practical application. There is more uh, recent writings and um, research that you can find in these two uh, volumes of uh, Revista de Mediación, which is a uh, Spanish and English version, and it just means uh, um, Journal of Mediation. And uh, a lot of the articles are very, very helpful. And Dr. Jamie Price, Dr. Marnie Jell, and Dr. Megan Price are uh, the people at the steering committee of Inside Collaborations International, the organization that I work with, and the organization uh, that works to promote insight um, internationally. These are some of its collaborators and these groups uh, come together to hold monthly events. Uh, there's going to be a third annual summit coming up in September. Uh, they're working to release their journal, their academic journal, and really build the inside community. So with that like overview of where it came from and who are the people driving this inside method, at its peacemaking core. The insight method seeks to help parties break out of the cycle of conflict, as I said, by gaining insights about their own and others' experiences. It is done through very much a reflective practice. What insight mediators and insight practitioners do is they support parties in the shift, in the shifting from not understanding or from being so firm in their understanding that they think they know, yet they lack a deeper understanding to getting an insight. And an insight is just that, it's a spark, it's a light bulb, it's a thought going, oh wait, I thought this was for sure, but that might not be true. And as these insights, as a practitioner, you help parties gain insights that eventually become connected and they start that transformation of the conflict. This is where the transformation begins. Now, it is very important to look at the conflict behaviors through an insight lens to understand more of a practical application of it. What do we do in conflict? And I'm sure that everyone in the room knows this, so I'll be brief. In conflict, we make quick decisions. These decisions are based on what we've learned in the past. They're based on the, the pot is hot when it sits on the stove, right? It's what you've learned in childhood where um, if you hit somebody, you're gonna hit back. Quick, quick decisions that help our brain operate. These are called schemas. These are called first order learning. This is something that we absolutely need to operate and to survive in the world and just make decisions quick. These are also the decisions and past experiences that inform our fight or flight. When we're in stress, 
cortisol, the stress hormone, increases in our body to the point where our choices are reduced. You either fight or you flight. Actually, it's fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, right? You either respond with a fight, you run away, you might just freeze and figure out what happens, or you try to appease saying, well, actually, it's not that bad. Come on, let's, let's, let's be friends. You're fawning. These are the reactions that your body naturally reduces your brain's capacity to choose between in an event if in Canada, what do you do if you're chased by a bear? Do you fight or do you flight? Actually, you don't want to run away. You just want to freeze and then you want to walk away. So these are very important for preservation of life, yet they're very, very unhelpful in conflict because these are the choices that are prone to error. What you've done in the past, what your past experiences, what your quick decisions tell you is something that you're most likely to choose when you're highly stressed in conflict, but that might not lead you to where you want to be in conflict. The insight method says that we act, so our actions in conflict are based on the decisions, the decisions we make in response to how we feel, to a feeling about what we think we know. So when I see the bear, I know that this is a bear and my feeling is fright. And I know the decision, the decision has to be freeze, don't run away, and that is my action to freeze. But what happens if it is a spouse, right, who slams through the door and comes angry at me? And I think that my spouse is really, really angry, and my feeling is fear. And my decision is, do I run, right? Do I hit back? What do I do? What is my act? The act that we choose is a defense. The act is to defend against what we perceive as a threat. And the threat is to what we care about the most. So while the physical explanation, right, like I care about my safety, so I'm going to defend against the threat to my safety by running away or by calling the police, a lot of the conflict is less physical and more, and more mind, right? I care about my reputation, so I don't want our fight to get out and be known. So what I care more about in this instance is not running away and calling the police because I want my reputation to be preserved. So what our choice and conflict is really deeply, deeply informed about what we deeply, deeply care about and how we perceive those threats to what we care about. Now, there is such a tool as called the insight loop. It's a deeply academic thought that I've been learning now for years. And it was developed by Dr. Jamie Price. Um, there is a video, there's a link here for you. Um, and it is a video by Dr. Megan Price that explains it. It's about 20 minutes long, and I highly recommend it if you're interested. But the idea is these wavy patterns on the side are your carriers of consciousness. These are your quick thinking decisions based on your life experience. And your life experience is unique to you and only you. And it is valid and it is important. These experiences inform how you perceive, how you understand, how you interpret what is happening in conflict and also how you make decisions. So experience goes in and action goes out. These, this figure right in the middle, that's your thinking. And this thinking happens so quick and it happens on so many levels, but it really is the process of thinking and action that is informed by your past and current experience. So what do you do? So now this whole information where inside approach, it wants you to gain these insights to help people transform conflict based on what they care about, based on what they think threatens and based on what they think will happen if this threat happens. The inside approach recommends using curiosity. What is curiosity? Curiosity is an innate desire to know. Children, when they're born, they, they're curious. They want to know. And this is something that everybody, it's something that we share across the planet. We are all curious. Researchers tell us that there's two types of curiosity. There is the, the novelty curiosity, 
what is this? This is new, this is exciting. And then there is a curiosity that wants to satisfy an uncertainty. A curiosity that tells me I'm uncertain. What is this? Oh, I know this. It, these are two extreme examples, and we usually operate somewhere on the on the line of this. But what insight does it, it wants you to find a curiosity sweet spot. You want to have some knowledge, so you have an interest in the topic, but you want to be unsure if you're right, because if you're sure and you're 100% confident, your curiosity has been satisfied. You're not curious anymore. On the other hand, if you know nothing about the subject, it's really hard to be curious about something that you don't know about. So uncertainty is what drives the curiosity. And what you do in insight is you want to expand your own or your party's curiosity. So the person that you're working with in conflict, you want to expand their curiosity about their own actions. And you want to expand that further to actions of others. So we that is how we constructively can engage in conflict transformation is by opening up that curiosity. What shuts down curiosity is stress. Stress levels up, fight or flight. We feel anxious, we worry, we're fearful, we feel hurt, we feel a loss of something and plain old injustice, right? All of these feelings and all of the other emotions that come with conflict, they really shut down your desire for curiosity. And, and who can blame a person who is afraid to be curious not only about their fear, but also about the fear and other emotions of others, right? So then the inside practitioners pause and say, how do we become curious and conflict? Well, what do you do if you're faced with this um, group of people and there's fear and anger and so many hurt emotions and everybody's so certain Right? Everybody is so confident in what the other person did and said and why they did it, right? It's, we're deep in this conflict. And what inside mediators do and inside coaches and practitioners, they ask questions. And there should be more questions than answers because the inside practitioners don't tell people how to transform their conflict. The inside practitioners ask people questions to guide their curiosity to come to their own answers and their own insights, these little sparks. And what these questions that ask people to find their own insights do is they create an understanding, a non-judgmental understanding of a person's experience in conflict. There is no judgment, there's just curiosity. And because you're not telling, you're not giving answers, you're listening to people that helps them reduce their feelings of stress. They feel heard, they feel understood. The stress comes down. They don't need to keep repeating themselves because they've been heard, they can move on. And when the people in conflict begin feeling understood and their stress levels come down, their cortisol levels are down, they're able to engage in more critical awareness. They, they're able to think more. They're able to think clearly and the insight questions, they begin taking them into a critical self-awareness, right? Are you sure that this is what happened? Are you sure that that is what, what was a threat? Are you sure that this is, this is what you think is gonna happen? Because oftentimes there is more to the story. This critical self-awareness, the more the person in conflict becomes to understand themselves, it helps them increase curiosity towards others. So they start not only being curious about their own feelings of interiority and conflict, but also about the feelings and experiences of others. So some of the practical applications include insight mediation, they include collaborative law, conflict coaching, as well as insight policing and insight artistry. And Insight mediation started with uh, Dr. Cheryl Picard, and there is a number of mediators across Canada and the United States that use Insight in their practice. And uh, recently, Insight was adopted as one of the formal uh, methods uh, by the Ontario Association of Family Mediators. 
Now, uh, insight is also used by collaborative lawyers, and these are the lawyers who, who create collaboration and transformation through their practice. And it's quite, um, it is very interesting if you follow some of these links, the process that these lawyers uh, undergo is a transformation of themselves, a transformation of their own understanding of their practice, understanding of their role as a lawyer in conflict, and also how, how they choose to perceive. So uh, uh, Jacinta Gallant, uh, who you will find if you follow that link, who is also part of uh, EC, Inside Collaborations International, uh, she spoke uh, often about how she had to learn herself to become curious and not to prescribe, but to wonder. So it takes you back again, ask more questions than have answers. Another way, so what I'm using with Inside is conflict coaching. And uh, I usually do it one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so if a party in conflict uh, is experiencing issues that are beyond their control, and I will speak more case examples a little bit later, uh, what I find is really helpful is taking them through this interiority of their own thoughts and understandings and helping them gain curiosity about themselves. With time and with work, it is possible to take them towards curiosity towards their partner or to the other person that they're in conflict with. And it really helps create a collaborative environment towards, towards building relationships and towards supporting changing of relationships. Um, Dr. Megan Price, uh, whose work you saw in uh, the previous slides of this presentation, uh, is involved with inside policing and inside policing works to decrease police violence and brutality in the United States. Um, I'm sure you've seen uh, things in the news with what's going on in the United States and same things happen in Canada too. And uh, Dr. Megan Price um, has uh, teaching seminars and coaches uh, police officers in the States to help them perceive the threats when they're interacting with uh, people in conflict or with people that they're arresting or people they're working with to help them understand their own interiority of what they perceive as a threat and to help them expand their decision-making in the moment to decrease the instances of police brutality. And um, other members of the EC, of the Inside Collaborations International, uh, use insight towards artistry. They use insight to understand the interiority of thinking that they take towards their art and towards their work and to understand what, what might lead us to certain thoughts and decisions and choices um, in conflict. And it is, uh, it is really quite an interesting adaptation of this approach towards, towards a completely different, um, different work than you know, conflict or policing. So here are some additional links, and I'm being mindful of the time. So um, Emerald, please let me know uh, when we're due for our uh, panel discussion. All right. Uh, OK, but uh, these are so some of the links that you might find helpful as you want to learn more in practicing insight. And uh, this is uh, Dr. Cheryl Picard's book on practicing insight mediation. Uh, in a previous slide, there's also, um, in one of the first slides, if you go back to it, uh, there's also links to Beyond Intractability. It's an online resource that can help you read more about Insight. But the, the gist of it is, is that as a mediator, as a lawyer, as a conflict professional, you want to come in with an open mind. You want to come in with questions. And these aren't just questions who, what did you do, right? These aren't just questions that who is at fault. These are the questions that are specifically targeted and I'll talk a bit more in our second session on the insight wheel. These are the questions that guide your mediator's mind to get the person you're working with to a certain point where they can gain an insight. And it is important to gauge where the person is in that moment uh, when you're working with them. So uh, some uh, some people that I've um, worked with were very expanded in their understanding. And that is why they came to a conflict coach because they've already done a lot of thinking and a lot of work to understand what's happening with them. 
And with those people, I was able to go pretty quickly through what their thinking is and what the other person's thinking is and what their choices in conflict might be. But with others, when stress is really high and when the thinking is really close, it might take some time to just listen. So at first, ask the questions to help them bring down that stress first and help them gain their own curiosity and help them decrease the stress, open up the mind and really gain their own insight. And sometimes it is a multiple, multiple session process where a person you know, can only take so much change in learning in one go. So it is as a mediator and as a conflict coach, it is a long game. And it is a, it is a process where you want each time you want to have progressive and cumulative results. So you build on your progress with every session and you accumulate your progress and you do it through the questions that first start. And Emerald, if I have five minutes, could I? Or if not, that's okay because then I will save it for the second part of the session. And can you proceed? Five minutes is okay. Five minutes is okay, thank you. Okay, so what the mediators, inside mediators and inside practitioners use are the questions, which what I've done is I've applied them to what I call the insight wheel and the interior, the interior circle of it is based on the awareness wheel. And it is what helps people process their own interiority. When I hear the door slam, I think you're mad. I feel angry. And instead of what I want is, I want a good relationship with you. So what am I going to do? And this is where it's crucial for the conflict coaches, taking the person through the choices. Well, what are you going to do? I used to yell, right? But you want change. You want to transform this conflict. So what I do supports that change. And here, this exterior wheel, that's the inside loop stretched out that figure eight with the wavy patterns that you saw earlier, that stretched out and applied to this interior thinking about an issue to help you as a mediator and as a conflict coach guide the person through deeper understanding of what they're experiencing, deeper verifying and expanding curiosity of, well, is that so? Is, am I being curious? Is the door actually being slammed or is there a draft? Right, I heard a slam, but was it a purposeful slam? Did I see right, him slam the door or did he just leave it open and it closed on its own? And then the valuing, how do I value what I think? Like this thought of mine that it was slammed and it was on purpose, but what is the value? What is, why does it matter, right? What's the feeling that emerges in that moment? And what would I imagine the future to be? And then all the questions about the I do is what helps us deliberate our choices. I can yell, I can you know, ignore, I can freeze, fight, fawn, but there's also more things that I can do. And as we open up our participants' minds and conflicts through acknowledging the issue first, right? You can't talk about conflict without acknowledging what the issue is. So then thinking about their interiority, what they sense, think, want, and then further expanding that curiosity to really being self-critical and self-aware and then being open to engage with the other parties' experiences and thinking and processes. So that is what um, I would like to leave us with for this moment before we transition um, onto the next steps. So Emerald, over to you. Thank you so much, um, Alina. Wow, that's quite interesting. A very interesting perspective on um, applying curiosity um, in terms of gaining insight in order to facilitate collaboration between parties and to enable them um, arrive at a more sustainable solution. So uh, looking forward to hearing more and uh, keeping the conversation going. Um, I'd like to request you to kindly drop your screen. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Um, at this juncture, we have uh, we will now proceed to the round table session. Uh, we have you will notice that we have a very rich and diverse uh, group of panelists. And uh, we seek to share their thoughts, to just pick their brains and uh, for them to share their thoughts on the insight approach vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, um, the, the, for them to share their uh, thoughts on the insight approach vis-a-vis -vis their areas of expertise, uh, their background, and uh, maybe how they can see relevance and applicability of the same. To begin with, um, I would like to uh, call upon um, uh, Morenike Obi Farinde, who is the founder of ODR Africa Network Nigeria. She is a board member of the International Council for Online Dispute Resolution and is also an accredited tutor of the Standing Conference of uh, Mediation um, Advocates in Nigeria. So, um, Morenike, what I would like to um, hear from you is relevance and applicability of the insight approach to conflict. Uh, based on uh, your experience as an ODR practitioner, uh, online mediator, also as a mediation tutor to advocates. Thank you. Over to you, Maureen Nike. Thank you, Emiral. Well, this is a very interesting approach to what I am used to, because I'm used to the facilitative approach, but it has so many similarities. And the similarities I see are the, we, we talk about issues and interests and positions. We talk about open questions to bring out the party's interest. The same way the inside approach uses curiosity and questions that ask questions of the party because it's like a self realized like a reality check. When you ask yourself whether you know, you'd have, you'd have to ask different questions if you were the coach as the mediator or the coach as the party representative. They said there are different angles to that. But what I would want to say is that I think it's all a collaborative effort to actually get to move conflict. We always, we call it in um, the facilitative idea. We, we talk about expanding the pie. We talk about seeing benefit in conflict. You talk about conflict transformation, but all of this is just to show that we need to deal with conflict in a way that the parties understand the other party. We talk about as mediators that our roles are to facilitate communication between the parties. As from the insight approach, what you or what the questioning does is really allowing each of those parties to understand why that person is taking the position and also evaluate what they really want. And that's when they start to have that self-realization that they can actually transform the conflict. And taking that to online dispute resolution for ODR practitioners, Technology as the fourth party does not replace the skills of the mediator. It only enhances it and makes it more efficient. So all of these um, um, ideas and skills are all inclusive and are all very beneficial, even when we use technology to improve dispute resolution, probably make it cheaper because for instance, people don't have to travel and we can do what we're doing make it faster because we don't have to think of, well, if I had to travel, I think of the travel time, I'll find a time that is convenient. But if I know I'm getting on a call, I don't have to leave my office so I can easily get that slot better than if I had to move. So really technology aids dispute resolution in that wise, not necessarily replacing the skills of the mediator or the mediator advocate that supports the process getting the parties to actually open up and getting them to understand really what it is that they want to achieve. Because when parties come to a table, the skill of the mediator at the table is to make them realize that just like um, Alina had said, they can transform that conflict. And that's what we call expanding the pie in our own type of um, mediator. So it's, it's not a close thing, it's a collaboration. It's actually making parties to see that there is benefit in collaboration rather than competing with each other.
Um, also, sorry about that. Uh, also, in addition to that, maybe you could say something about uh, the multi-door courthouse uh, system. In my understanding, that would be the equivalent of uh, the court annex mediation here in Kenya. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, kindly say something about that and also how you see the insight approach um, affecting this. Thank you. Yes. Very right, the courts connected ADR um, center. They, well, I walk out of the Lagos multi door courthouse where I teach mediation and I also mediate. And um, it's actually the very first in Africa. And uh, we have uh, so many across, even in Nigeria, so many other states have replicated that. And it's the same facilitative approach that we use. And I see the insight approach not as competing with it, but actually as improving the work that is being done. So it's something that I, I, we should, uh, that I, I would recommend. And I'm sure we will be contacting Alina soon from Nigeria just to also introduce it because this is something that I think this would also help the questioning skills of mediators, the inside approach, because it, it makes the mediators actually think deeper and actually feel and connect better with the parties and also find giving them the opportunity to connect with each other. So I think it's uh, something that is complementary to what is done, the facilitative mode of mediation at the Lagos Multi-Door Courthouse right now. Uh, thank you for, for that commentary, Morenike. Um, next panelist, uh, we have mediator Patricia Okech. She is a counseling psychologist a certified professional mediator and a grief recovery specialist. Mediator Patricia, how do you see this in terms of application by mediation practitioners, especially in the area of grief recovery? Thank you very much. And thank you, Elena. Um, as I was listening to her, I, 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 I really felt like she was introducing uh, the insight learning where somebody learns by insight and understands faster. Um, I also see, uh, or maybe I didn't hear correctly, but I see her talking about as a person, I would know what is going on inside me for me to understand the other person. So as I'm asking the questions, I'm getting the person to understand themselves so that they can understand the, the, the other party that is there. And as I compare this to, to grief recovery, I also see a place where I have to understand myself with the loss that I have and everything that I have before I understand the rest of the world. And so the questions that an insight, um, an insight approach practitioner is asking is really for me, like when somebody goes for counseling, it's really for them, and then they can translate it to the other person. Um, and, and I believe that that is how it can be used also in mediation, uh, that I learn what I need in the mediation and understand that person from my position. Thank you so much, uh, Mediator Patricia. Uh, Mediator Susan Wendot, the next panelist is Mediator Susan Wendot, who is a human, right, who is a human resource professional for very many years and also a certified professional mediator. Mediator uh, Susan, uh, our question to you would be, how would this, uh, would be in terms of application to the to workplace mediation and how would mediators apply this in the workplace setting? Uh, thank you, Emerald, and the earlier presenters and the panelists. I think uh, from the coaching uh, insight, I look at coaching just the way Patricia said, it has to begin with you as the person who is uh, handling to understand yourself and also to understand the, the workplace, how, how it uh, works, so that you'll be able to use it to support uh, individuals in the workplace. And uh, this improves their knowledge, their skills, and even abilities to more understand and manage the interpersonal relations or disputes that arise in the workplace. 
And uh, as you uh, develop that understanding of how to respond to conflicts and changes in attitude and behavior, this will impact the changes. So you have to really understand what are these insights into these uh, conflicts. And you as a coach or even as a mediator, you have to understand what are these disputes or conflicts that are uh, in the workplace. And you need to understand, uh, to, to understand yourself as a coach and understand the situation that is in the organization to be able to, 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 to assist or in that matter to be able to solve or assist them to, uh, to, to resolve the conflicts. And also the coaching, it prevents a necessary escalation of a conflict situation. As you find many organizations spend a lot of money in litigation because of issues that could have been sorted out if uh, the managers of that organization had the knowledge in uh, conflict coaching or mediation. So uh, it helps in the future, it anticipates like uh, the managers to be trained on coaching, conflict coaching so that it uh, prevents or they are able to be competent in handling that uh, conflict. And it also helps in a challenging conversation. Maybe there's an issue coming up. So if you have the knowledge in coaching uh, conflict, you are able to assist in such a, a, a situation for a person or groups and also de uh, develop stronger management skills. Uh, for example, when it comes to performance management, that's where a lot of conflicts come because an employee will be like, no, this is not my performance. So you have to really understand uh, that and to manage it as a leader in the, in the organization. Uh, and also prepare in participating in a, in a conflict. So, um, and address matters that may arise post, post mediation. Maybe the person you are mediating, they are not satisfied with their outcome. So you will be able to assist um, and to have resilience on and resolve the emotions and even issues or uh, relationship dynamics. So the skills that one applies, I mean, uh, learns, in conflict management can be applied in, in such situation and also improve resilience and um, ability to manage future difficulties that may come. So there is a lot of um, uh, benefits that organizations can gain on this uh, conflict coaching because it will, re, um, as I said earlier, it will promote real learning and reflection the individual reflection on uh, the, the issue at hand, and also helps to sustain changes in behavior because the organization is comprised of uh, different people from different backgrounds who have different values. And those different backgrounds and values is what brings about conflicts. So it will enable the individuals to better understand uh, different people styles or even the communication styles that people have and it will build the individual's confidence in adaptive uh, adapting uh, styles and engaging in difficult um, conversations and it will also reconcile um, conflict situation by improving the understanding and enabling the individual to move forward. So those are some of the things that I captured on this uh, insight uh, approach that you need to really go deeper and understand what are the issues that are there. And maybe as a manager, you also, um, uh, they need training on this conflict management so that um, they are able to handle any anticipated uh, conflict that may arise in future. So it is like future oriented so that you are not reactive to situations 
but you are already prepared and have the skills to, to tackle or to handle any situation, uh, conflict situation that may come up. So thank you so much. That's what I had. Thank you so much, uh, Mediator Susan. Alina, would you like to comment on some of those commentaries? Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you, mediators, Patricia, Moranike, and Susan. Uh, these are wonderful insights, and I am so pleased and so grateful that these are the connections that came up for, for you when I presented this uh, method, because it is true, it is, it is future-oriented, and it does promote real learning between parties. That is how conflicts can be transformed, how relationships can be improved and bettered. And it helps, as you said, in the workplace, it helps with bereavement support, it helps in mediation within the legal field, because it does help us as professionals support, support the people we work with in understanding themselves better and in being open to understand others. And then that supports building off better relationship with more constructive working ways together. And the more we practice, the better we become. And the people that we've practiced with, I've noticed in my experience, they get better at it too. So it's one of those things that it's cumulative, it grows. And it, it's really uh, wonderful that you've made these connections to your own fields and to, you know, to your own expertise from this. So thank you. Thank you so much, Elena. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Mediator Sam Nyamu, our YMM uh, for the month, to give a few commentaries on this roundtable session. Thank you, Emerald. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the most interesting thing I learned about, um, about the insight approach is learning is a very uh, important part of uh, an important co important component of it because um, learning changes and transforms the mind and how and it, it, it changes your perspective um, I'd like to, I, I agree with uh, I agree with uh, Morenike um, in where she said uh, where she said that uh, it is the insight method is complementary to uh, facilitative mediation, because I think with, with insight mediation, it goes to the genesis of the problem. Whereas you'd find that when, when you're, uh, you're, you're, you're facilitating a mediation, your focus is, you, you might notice the hidden assumptions or the fears, the body language that is not otherwise said or, um, visible to the naked, naked eye and such things such things are things you'll notice in the facilitative method and you'll work around probably using different techniques like paraphrasing what the other party has said maybe separating the parties and having um independent consultations with them caucuses as we call them but now in the insight approach you're able to achieve all that in the same room because you're, you've you've cre you've um, you've eliminated the, the 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 perception of threat, right? So the moment you eliminate the perception of threat, people are more relaxed, eh, and now you're you're able to have a deeper conversation, and even if you have conflicting views, right? So I think in that in that respect, um, insight the insight approach is really is really complementary to the facility, to mediation in general, and especially in sensitive cases such as, um, as uh, Patricia was saying, uh, the deal when you're dealing with grief, such uh, when when you're dealing with parties, for instance, in a succession matter, there are very many feelings and emotions at play, right? You might find that parties are not even disputing; it's not even a legal matter. It's more about mom favored you more than she favored me, right? And those are things that the insight approach is able to uncover, is able to um, uncover and bring to surface, uh, as opposed to, as uh, I think it's more, 
it is more effective in terms of finding the genesis of the root cause of the problems. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Medita Sam, for that elaborate commentary. Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I believe we have reached uh, the point where we will proceed to a five minute health break. Uh, refresh your cup of tea, coffee, glass of water, take a stretch, uh, come back so that we can come back to another um, uh, session and uh, yes, and proceed from there. Thank you so much. See you in five minutes. Welcome back, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is the Wasiliana Hub Quarter 2 Virtual Mediation Day Symposium for the year 2021. Uh, we are very grateful to have you here. Uh, we are currently in the process of going through the first session, which is on conflict coaching and uh, from the perspective of mediation from the insight approach to conflict. I would like to mention at this point that we will be having another session, the second session of the symposium on the 24th of June, 2021, uh, from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. And it will be on the Naivasha Proposed Judiciary Court Annex Mediation Rules uh, for the year 2020. And the session is dubbed Ask Me Anything. Uh, the session will be graced by Honorable Wanjala, who is the registrar of uh, the Mediation Accreditation Committee. I would also like to um, mention that uh, this is part of the international masterclass, which is um, part of the June Continuous Learning Education Experiential Series. Uh, and it is also the third effective mediator masterclass. Uh, we have had two previous masterclasses before. Uh, back in April, uh, kindly feel free to visit the YouTube page, the Wasiliana Hub YouTube page so that you can access the previous masterclasses. June is also the Young Mediator Mentee Month in which uh, this is the month that Wasiliana Hub highlights the young mediators on board and gives them, a, gives them an opportunity to participate on this platform and uh, showcase and highlight their areas of expertise. This month we are highlighting uh, the Young Mediator Mentee of the month, uh, Sam Nyamo, who is a graduate, an LLB graduate of the National University of Lesotho. He is an associate um, of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, and he is also a certified professional mediator. Uh, it is very interesting and very encouraging to see that uh, we are having more and more young people um, entering the ADR space, uh, mediation, and uh, creating an impact. Uh, from from wherever they are. So now we have we are at the second session, which is uh, now uh, the part the second session. We will now proceed to have another presentation by Elena, our session facilitator. And what she will walk us through is um, the second part of the insight approach, which is uh, I think I believe that she mentioned a bit of it in the beginning, but now she's uh, going to delve a bit more into it, uh, which is the insight wheel. And uh, she will also proceed to give us a few case study briefs on uh, and scenarios on how this has been applicable in her area, in her experience, especially in areas such as family, commercial, um, workplace and community. After that, we'll proceed to have a presentation on conflict transformation paradigm by Reverend Professor Peter Gishuri from the Catholic University of Eastern Africa. And then we will proceed to the second roundtable discussion and after which we will close. As mentioned earlier, we are co-moderating this session with uh, our YMM uh, Mediator of the Month, 
mediator Sam Nyamu. I will ask him to kindly uh, introduce himself again and also introduce uh, Elena, our facilitator for the day, so that we can usher in the second session of the session. Thank you. Kindly, Sam, proceed. Thank you, Emerald. Uh, as, as, as Emerald said, I am Sam Nyamo, the Young Mediator of the Month, and I must say it is quite, it's, it's quite an honor um, to also be here in this space with um, all of you, and also to, to learn more about mediation and different approaches to con conflict. Um, our facilitator today is Alena Asta, a conflict coach and facilitator specializing in the inside approach. Uh, Elena has done a lot of work. I, I must say your, your, your bio is quite impressive, Elena, in terms of um, conflict, uh, conflict and conflict resolution, because um, preparing for um, even this, this symposium, I learned so much more than I expected to, just preparing. And it, it has also uh, changed my perspective or my view towards um, meet the mediations that I, I, I facilitate. I, I definitely intend on applying this approach. Anyway, with that said, I'd like to welcome you to the floor to take over. Thank you so much, Mediator Sam. Uh, it is such an honor and a pleasure to be here with all of you. And, and I do hope um, my, the, my purpose of uh, being here is helping you plant helping plant the seeds of insight and helping you wonder about your own practice and maybe helping you find places where you can find more information uh, should you choose to uh, because i know that in this space i won't be able to do everything there is to know about insight and have part of it as a successful um insight mediator and what i hope to do is plant the seeds that can then out within your own practice and grow and um, and lead to insight as you as you work and grow as a practitioner yourself. So I'm going to share my screen with you and we will come right back to the insight wheel. I'm glad I got to show you my computer. I'm really glad I got to show you the the insight wheel just before our break here. So hopefully a return to it will help it seem a little bit less overwhelming. So once again, we're going to quickly look over the awareness wheel. And the awareness wheel is a tool, it's a very simple tool, but it is effective in its simplicity. And what I find is it helps you sometimes internally guide people through their own thinking and conflict and I language. language extremely important for people to be able to be heard, for people to be able to share their experience without, without bringing up threats in others. So it takes out the blame, it takes out the, the threat, it takes out the anger in a way where you can't argue with I, right? If I, when I see you walk away, um, when I'm talking to you, I think that you're trying to ignore this issue and I feel really betrayed. And what I want instead is to be able to figure this out with you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to commit to maybe finding a different way to talk other than standing in your face. So when a person, what I found in my experience, um, when people in conflict are having a really difficult time communicating, especially when people in conflict have difficult time being in the room together. I bring out the awareness wheel and I bring it out on a piece of paper and it goes right on the table in front of them. And it does two things. It helps them guide in the, in the stress of the mind. It helps guide their thinking. It gives them what they need to say to be heard. And it also, it helps them take turns because the, the paper passes around the room across the table, right? So it's a talking stick and it's a guide to being heard. 
Now, what I've done with Insight and the Awareness Wheel is I've expanded it for the use of the mediator. So this is not something that I show to, uh, to the people that I work with because it is way too complicated. And this is something for me to guide my thinking in the choice of questions and the choice of the targeted curious questions. So the Insight, a uh, very important thing to know is that these aren't just any questions. These are very specific, very targeted questions that are used at a specific time to produce a certain response. So the reason we ask questions is not just to ask, but not just to learn, but we want to uh, we want to discover a specific type of information on insight. We want to uncover it at a specific time. So I don't want to be asking a question about what people are doing when I'm asking about their experiencing, their sensing. So when I start with people and I say, well, what did you notice, right? What did you sense? What did you hear, see, smell, touch? And also paying attention to what didn't you see, right? Did you see them pull back or were, were you looking for it, right? It makes people think, oh, maybe I wasn't looking for that. Um, it makes people notice what they're noticing. And then when I move on to, I think when I'm guiding my clients through their thinking, I will ask to understand if they're curious or if they're not, that helps me gauge their own capacity. Are they being critical of their own thinking or are they making quick decisions based on their quick pre-made schemas and their first order learning? Like, are they just thinking too quickly? And that is, is that so? I find it to be the most useful question. Is that so? So they say, you know, I saw that he was going to hit me. I, you know, I saw him punch. You know, is that so? Tell me more. Or an example would be a little less physical is I know that he doesn't want to engage. I, you know, I don't see him engage. He's not coming in to talk to me. So he doesn't want to, to do this work for us to have a relationship together. Is that so? Somehow, interestingly, people respond to it. People actually answer and they go, well, and they go deeper. They kind of go, oh, well, maybe, well, maybe he did this and maybe there's that. That starts the unknowing. That begins to take you back to that red dot where you want to be in the sweet spot of curiosity. That shakes a little bit of their certainty and starts making them a little bit uncertain. And you have to be careful, you know, not to take it too far. But I find that is that so question so useful to, to test just how certain people are. And if they're very incurious, if they're very hasty, then I spend some little time there. That's where I need to be. What could it be? Ask more questions. So as they tell you more, well, is that so? You just keep kind of going deeper and deeper until, okay, you're curious. And then we're going to valuing. And the reason valuing takes the two spaces of I want and I feel is because it is a very, very big part of our, of our experience in conflict. That's our feeling, right? It's our feeling about the feeling that emerges about what we think, right? When I think that, uh, the partner doesn't want to engage with me in building this relationship. He doesn't want to do the work. I feel, well, what do you feel? Betrayed, lonely, sad, hopeless. There's a lot of feelings that emerge, but there is also a future. There's a hope narrative because there's something that you're hoping for that you're not getting. So what you feel, right? And what you want is threatened. The sadness that you feel about what you think you're not getting in interaction with your partner is threatens what you want. And maybe what you want is a relationship. You just don't know how to get there. So the really helpful questions in here are, what is the, what is at stake? Right? Well, what's at stake for you, right? If you don't work through it, what is, what's at stake? Divorce is on the line, right? So that's really big. But what is upsetting you about this in this feeling? So why are you sad? What's upsetting you about the feeling that he doesn't want to talk, right? What are you worried is going to happen? Are you worried that, you know, the answer might be you're worried that you'll never be able to work through this and that is how it's going to be, right? So your questions here, you're asking what is the significance? Why is this important, right? What do you hope is it helps you understand all of these complicated feelings 
and thoughts and wants that the person is experiencing. And these are the feelings, that's the lower part of the loop when you saw that figure eight with the waves around it. That's, that's what you're valuing, that's what you're thinking and that's what you want. These emotions, these thoughts and feelings guide what you're going to choose to do. If you're contracted, right? If you're not being mindful, you're gonna feel you know, threatened you're going to want to lash out because you want to correct it. And you might decide to walk away. You might decide to explode. You might decide to ignore. You might decide to hire a lawyer, right? And punish a punitive legal action, right? I, I'm going to take, you know, everything that he owns because I'm so angry right now. When you're elemental, when you're not opened, right? And you're valuing, you make rash decisions that end up hurting the relationship. Now, some relationships, they just need help being taken apart and that's okay, right? Not every relationship needs to be rebuilt and transformed, but there are plenty of relationships where parties in conflict want to have a relationship, whether it's two separated parents wanting to effectively co-parent their children, whether it's an adult child and their parent that want to have a better relationship as they age, whether it's um, co-workers who are working together and they both want to be working in that place and they need a relationship that doesn't impede their progress. So then what we do is we help them deliberate what their choices are, evaluate the effectiveness of the deliberated choices, and then deciding and committing to an action. So you ask these questions as a mediator, well, what could you do, right? What could you do? I go, well, I can, you know, I can walk away. I can hire a lawyer, but what will do not change, right? And then they start thinking, well, you know, if I walk away, it's the same thing. It won't change anything. Okay, what are you trying to accomplish? What are you, what, what, what are you trying to do with this? Well, I want us to be able to talk. Okay, so will walking away help you talk? Will hiring a lawyer help you parent your children after you separate, right? Will, you know, taking everything that they have to punish them for your feelings of loss in this relationship, will that help you build a communication, a way to communicate and talk with your partner where you can both parent your children after? They don't have to, you know, live together, you don't really have to be friends, but you want to be able to face each other and talk to each other and share parenting time, right? Will this help or will it impede, right? So then once you've questioned all of these options, you go, well, what's your best option, right? Based on your imagined future, based on what you want, what is your best option, right? And then you wanna get that commitment. What will you do, right? What will you do differently? Uh, what I find helps is, next time they walk away, right? What will you do? Because that helps prepare, it helps build. So you've made this um, progress, right? Of expanding what they're thinking, right? Of understanding their valuing. And you now want to build on it, but you also know that next time they're in conflict, there's probably gonna be a moment where emotions are high again, and you fall into your patterns that are used to, you fight or you flight, right? You freeze or you fawn, because that's how you do it and that's what's comfortable. So that commitment to action, what are you going to do instead? When you notice that feeling coming up, what are you going to remember in that moment to do? Ah, you're gonna remember not to slam the door. Okay, but what are you gonna do instead? Breathe, great. And this might work, and it's always remember important to remind people, this might work, or you might try it, right? And then you might wanna go with a different option. So it's a process, it's not a, you're not offering, it's not snake oil, it's not a solution that just happens like this, right? It's, it's a change process. There's gonna be many things you try until you fall into that new way of your relationship working together. So some of the examples that I would like to share with you from my, uh, my own experience, uh, the first uh, case study is an entrenched conflict. And what it worked is it was a family conflict and it was an estranged relationship between an adult child and a parent. So the estrangement happened between 
one parent and two adult children. The triangle just wasn't working anymore. And uh, it was about five years of no interaction. And the adult children had their own children and the families were growing and the adult parent um, approached me wanting to rebuild some of that relationship because they felt um, sad and worried that that's gonna be the rest of their life when they don't get to see their grandchildren. So the, the feared future, right? The fear was that they won't get to see their grandchildren and the desire was to have a relationship, to have that, uh, to have that relationship. And that is something that we came to as we work. But initially the concept was, you know, my kids are fighting, I'm fighting with them. I can't take sides, um, help. And the goal was not to help people separate, but the goal was to transform a relationship. And it was an entrenched conflict. Because it's been five years, there was no contact and any contact up until then was ineffective, right? It just entrenched the conflict further. So if we look back at the inside wheel, uh, we actually did that in person, obviously it was pre-pandemic and it was quite a few, it was a few uh, years of working through that on and off with the family as we were making these changes in relationships. So between the adult child and the parent, I used the insight wheel, insight wheel on a table because being in the room was a lot, right? Uh, and when you work with people in high conflict situations, the stress of being in that presence brings up so many emotions and so many feelings. So having that um, awareness wheel on the table really helps. And, and I took them through just their experience. When I don't get to talk to you, right? When I, what you don't know, it's like when I don't have, what I don't hear from you, when I don't get emails, I think, you know, I think that this is it, that I don't get to see you, to have a relationship with you. And, and I feel sad. And then I worry. So when I was taking the adult parents through the worries that came up was not seeing the grandchildren, uh, not having a relationship and wanting to have more. And there, what they did is to be in the room. So they're what I do is I am here to listen and to learn, right? And the response, and then we took it in circles. So then the adult child responded with um, a lot of hurt and a lot of things came up in the past. And as um, some of the people speaking before are saying that, you know, when you're in uh, mediation, you're looking more about the future while you also in counseling, you have people bringing in their past. So this is that blend in the conflict coaching between, right? And in mediation, you also are still conscious of it uh, through the inside approach that people's past experiences, they always, um, they, they always inform what people think and choose and feel. And you can't take the past, you can't take the emotion out of the mediation room. It's right there. Conflict is an emotional thing and addressing it helps it move along instead of just shoving it down. So the emotions that came up for the adult child at that point was um, a lot of issues that they had with the sibling and feeling that the parent uh, was not favoring them, right? They were favoring the sibling and they felt really wrong. So what I did in uh, one of the key sessions we had was let each party speak their piece. Right, so each party got turn and turn and turn again in using the awareness wheel to say that what they sensed, what they thought, what they felt wanted and what they were going to do and what that transformed the relationship into was then being able to transform a relationship so the adult child and the parent in the room can now they actually have a relationship so they built what that did is that it put trust right, their ability to share their feelings from the I statement allowed them to say their piece, right, reduce some of that stress. And also the other party could, couldn't say anything because it's when I, you know, don't get a response, I feel sad. What are you going to say to that? You can't say anything. It's not that you make me so upset when you ignore me. That's a you. That's a blaming. You can say, well, I don't do anything because no, I can't make you feel what you do. So they laid a foundation of trust. And with that foundation of trust, they're able to 
transform the relationship and I guided them in understanding how each other's actions made them feel and question, right? Is that, you know, your, it was the um, a brother and a sister and the key was that they did not want to be in touch. And that is also okay. So how to guide the parent in having two children who chose to separate their relationships, who chose to just remain without contact, but also how to support the parent in being a parent to both children in healthy relationships. And the insight helped, the insight helped in getting these insights and what was really, really important to this parent. And to this parent, what she found is that having the connection with both children separately was more important than having them come together or not have a relationship because the children were so adamant that they will not have a relationship. The parent was able to work through the grief of the loss of that relationship and move forward in finding a new relationship that works. So she still got to see her grandchildren on both sides. She still gets to have the relationship with the children on both sides. She doesn't get the relationship of the one family together, but considering where they came from over time, the relationship transformed into the key insights, the core feelings that that parent was defending with her actions have actually been protected and valued. Now, um, moving on to the second case study, uh, this one is a bit um, different because uh, this family conflict uh, it relies to elder care. And uh, a family that I coached through was uh, making end of life care decisions. A parent was diagnosed with terminal cancer and uh, it was uh, quick and it was sudden and uh, the parent had to make choices. In Canada, uh, there is a uh, doctor assisted suicide that is allowed. Uh, it's a controversial issue. Some people are for, some people are against. And that parent wanted to sign the document saying that if she became incapacitated to a certain point, that she wanted it, her life to end at that point and not for it not to be prolonged any further. Now the child had a lot, a lot, a lot of issues with it. So when they came to me to conflict, to coach them through this decision and through this acceptance, uh, most of my work lied with the child, with the adult child, and it was helping them gain insights into what was it that they were defending. By refusing to agree to those terms of the parent, what were they defending against? What was a threat? And turned out the threat was their, their capacity as a child, that, that they weren't being a good child by allowing their parent to sign that. It was a fear of not being good enough. And when, as we worked through their choices, right? What are their options? The, the child said, you know, they can say no, they can fight with their parent. And the question was then, if you look at your mediator wheel, so if you look back here, right? There, so what were the choices? Well, what could you do? Well, I can fight it. What else could you do? Well, I can just, you know, accept it, or I can maybe fight with the doctors. I can fight with my mother. What's that going to change? Nothing. Your mother will die. It is imminent. That is what is happening, right? So what are you trying to accomplish here? You're trying to prove to your mother that you're a good child and that you care for you. What's the best option to show that you're a good child and you care for your mother? How do you want to spend her remaining months? Do you want to spend fighting to show you care? Or are there other ways you can show you care, right? What could you do differently? So then the child goes, well, I can spend time doing this. I can spend time doing this. And I can tell her that that's what my concern is. Great. What are you going to do? The choice was I'm going to lay off. I'm going to let her do what she wants and spend the rest of that time just visiting and being and caring and not fighting. And through those actions, you can show that you're a good child in those final moments. Now, this last case study is a community conflict and it is an organizational conflict. So um, a local elementary school 
uh, here in Vancouver uh, had issues with bullying for um, a decade, to, to the best of my knowledge. So the bullying uh, happened, bullying continued, and the school dealt with it the best way it could. There's uh, tools within the school board uh, that this is what the teachers can do because there's not much the teachers can do, right? Uh, they can talk to the child, they can explore things with the child. The school has a lot of processes that identify issues that some children might have and work correctively on that. But bullying was still happening. And a lot of parents on the, um, on the playgrounds and, and their parents' spaces were talking about this being a constant, constant issue that started in kindergarten. And as the issue progressed, uh, the school found that some of the children were avoiding the school. So they would go, they would start kindergarten at a different school because of this common knowledge that the school had a bullying issue. And the problem was that this is the biggest school, elementary school in this community. And as communities grow and school space becomes very uh, limited, uh, the school needed to make it work for the parents where parents with an attachment felt safe going to the school and that would free up the schools in the other areas and let the children be in the spaces uh, safely. So at that point I came in to build collaborative relationships. I knew that the school was doing everything they could but I also, in my analysis, noticed that what was missing was a relationship between parents and teachers. It was school administration and teachers working with children to prevent bullying and then saying that kids brought it to school from home. And then it was the parents saying that kids went to school and got bullied, yet there was no collaboration before. So a change needed to happen. And the, the leverage points that I found to be the most effective was to change the relationship between the parents and the teachers through building trust. So now we're going to go back to the insight wheel and the interviews that I held with the parents and the teachers and the support workers really focused on their experience. So their experience, and I have to say that while parents were happy to talk about their experience of their children being bullied, teachers were fearful. They avoided, right? So they did a, whole, a lot of avoidance. It was hard to track them down. Uh, there was a lot of defense, right? There was a lot of fawning, like, oh no, everything's fine. It's not a big deal with managing. Or there was a lot of, well, we had, um, you know, there's these reports uh, on bullying. So we held a, um, a meeting about it. We did an action, right? So it's a fun behavior where, look, we're trying to appease you by holding this meeting. Is that not enough? Well, when I finally got the teachers to talk and it's a one-on-one, -on -one, there was a lot of, what is this experience to you? What do you see happening? What do you, um, what do you hear, right? What do you hear from children? What words are you hearing? What are you hearing from parents, right? What are you hearing from your supervisors, right? Because the teachers between the parent, the child and their boss, the school administration, right? And how does that, what do you think, right? When your child tells you that they got pushed in the playground, what do you think? I found that a lot of the times teachers thought that that was just normal behavior. And they also thought that there's a bit of blame happening that this child brings it from home and that is what it is, right? They can't, there's only so much they can do. And they also had a lot of feelings of being bullied themselves. So the teachers have found were they found themselves, they felt bullied instead. So when they heard parents complain about their child bullying, what they were thinking is, but how about me? I feel bullied by you. So when we discovered that, an amazing thing happened is the teachers began feeling less defensive, right? There in the earlier slides, we've hit that curiosity sweet spot, right? They were able to share their own knowledge and their own experience. The levels of stress came down. They didn't have to defend. This was a non-judgmental meeting. I was just there to ask curious questions and find out. And there with that defense, the stress shut down and they became a bit more curious. And they said, well, what is it like for the parents? Right? If you've listened to me, okay, I can listen too. And so we began to look at what the parents might be experiencing when their kids are on 
a hockey team. Hockey is very popular here, and there's a lot of bullying behaviors that you can see on the rink. So when the teacher said, oh, yes, you're right, when the parent you know, has to agree to these behaviors of their child on the team for them to be on a team, and then the school complains about it, the parents got to be stuck in a hard place. Yeah, so what do you want instead? How do you want your relationship with the parent to go instead of them coming and complaining to you and you feeling threatened? Well, they said, I want a way to communicate. I want to wait for us to talk and to build friendship. I said, okay, well, what are you going to do? What can you do about it? Because, and it's not, it's a two-way street, right? The parents had that talk and the parents, what are you going to do when your child comes in? You're going to ask your child certain questions. You're going to try to understand. You're going to notice your own feelings towards it, right? And then you can talk to the teacher in this way, right? In a way that doesn't bring out their threat, in a way that shares your concerns and hears out the teacher, and then you can work them together. And the same for the teacher. And the teachers had to instill that in the parents, right? So then the teacher said, okay, I am going to be more open about what happens to the children, right? I'm going to tell the parent, your child came to me saying that they felt bullied or your child came to me saying that they were pushed on the playground. And we're, um, I actually had that experience myself when a teacher told me, uh, your son told me that he was upset that he was hugged by a child, COVID times, right? So a hug upset my own son and he felt threatened and the teacher noticed and she told me about it. So had she not communicated this and had I heard it from my son, I might've felt what is going on? What is happening? Stress goes up, anger spills onto teacher. This preemptive communication help the teacher find a way to reduce that. So as we are running up, uh, coming to the end of our time, I would like to close these three case studies with a thank you, uh, with a thank you for your uh, time and your presence and being here and for listening to this uh, new way that builds on all of this knowledge that you've, uh, you've brought to this room. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what you think and uh, how you think you could use this. Thank you. Thank you again, Elena, for taking us through the insight wheel. Uh, we will now proceed to a presentation by Reverend Professor Peter Gishuri on conflict transformation paradigm. Thank you. Confirm me this right. So thank you very much, Lena. That was very informative. And now to complement what we have heard about uh, insight, uh, we now are going to look at what we call the conflict transformation. Uh, this is a new way of looking at conflict, that conflict must not end with you just by resolution or management. And so they have put a spectrum of what we can do. We have adjudication if there's a conflict, or we can have arbitration, or we can have conflict management, or we can have conflict resolution, or we can have uh, mediation. And you can see at the end, uh, the desired uh, result is always the conflict transformation, because that's where uh, people who live together, they may, they may need to transform their conflict into something that is meaningful. Next slide. So conflict transformation aims at addressing the structural and the social root causes by challenging injustices and restoring human relations, and it deals with the ethnical and value-based uh, dimensions. Whereas uh, conflict transformation involves transforming the relationship that support violence, Conflict management, as I've said, approaches seeks to merely manage and contain conflict. And conflict resolution approaches seek to move conflict parties away from the, what we call the zero sum positions towards positive outcomes, often with the help of an external actors. According to 
Belgov Foundation. This is how they define uh, COVID transformation. A generic comprehensive term referring to actions and processes seeking to alter the various characteristics and manifestations of violent conflict by addressing the root causes of a particular conflict over the long term. So it aims to transform negative destructive conflict into positive constructive conflict and deals with the structural, behavioral, and attitudinal aspect of conflict. So you can see here, we are trying to say, even if you made it between two parties and they're living together or in the neighborhood, they can still become destructive uh, with each other. So the term refers to both the process and the completion of the process. So the process here is very important. So conflict transformation theory and practice and process comprise one, mapping the conflict formation, that means all parties, all goals, and all issues. Secondly, bringing in forgotten parties with important stakes in the conflict. This is very important because some non mediators, we may not notice that there are some parties that have been forgotten. Three, having highly empathic dialogues with all parties singly. And fourthly, each conflict worker may specialize on one conflict party. Fifth, in these dialogues, identifying, identifying acceptable goals in all parties. So the goals can be, uh, sometimes can be forgotten. Eh? So that means that we bring in together goals that may open new perspectives. When people come, especially in Africa, people may come with what we normally call hidden agendas. There, uh, the mediator may want to open that. And then that seventhly, arriving at overarching goals acceptable to all parties. So conflict uh, trans, uh, then continued. Uh, eight, arriving at short evocative goal formulations, which we normally do, helping define the task for all parties with that goal in mind. Then yeah, this means disembedding the conflict from where it was, embedding it elsewhere, uh, bringing it in forgotten parties' goals, parties and goals. And then 10, verifying how realizing that goal would realize parties' goals. Helping parties meet at the table for self-sustaining process. A very important, self-sustaining. 12, withdrawing from the conflict, go on to the next being on call. <clears throat> so conflict should not be regarded as an isolated event that can be resolved or managed, but it's an integral part of society's ongoing evolution and development. So conflict should not be understood solely as an inherently negative and destructive occurrence, but rather as a potentially positive and productive force for change if harnessed constructively. Here yeah, the, uh, the key word is to harness it constructively. Conflict transformation goes beyond merely seeking to contain and manage conflict. Instead, seeking to transform the root causes of a particular conflict. Conflict transformation is a long-term, gradual, and complex process requiring sustained engagement and interaction. So conflict transformation is not just an approach and set of techniques, but a way of thinking about and understanding conflict itself. So, okay, that's all.
Thank you so much, uh, Reverend Professor Peter Gishure. Um, listening into uh, the insight approach and its application using the insight wheel as uh, uh, given to us as presented to us by Elena, as well as um, listening into the conflict transformation paradigm by Professor Peter Gishure, I cannot help but see a connection and a relevance between um, in how the insight approach is relevant and how it plays a big role towards the, 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 the overall shift, mind shift towards conflict in general, and also just um, uh, conflict transformation as he had put it. So it's actually a very interesting topic to look into. Um, at this point, I would like to call upon our convener for today's session, um, Mediator Wangari Kabiru to say something before we proceed to the second round table session. Thank you. Karim. Asante sana, and I welcome everyone to this uh, session. Thank you very much uh, to our moderator, Mediator Emerald Videga, and also to our young uh, mediator for the month, uh, that is uh, Sam Yamo. We are delighted. June is normally a very exciting month for us because we take a break. And as you can see, they take charge. And that's really exciting. I'm actually looking forward to hear uh, from especially someone like uh, Honorable uh, Kendagor because I know she's very passionate about these young uh, mediators. So I think uh, our speaker today, um, Elena Asta, I'll still be practicing how to say your full name and also uh, Professor uh, Peter Gishure. The presentation by uh, Professor Peter Gishure was part of a presentation that um, uh, we did uh, uh, at the Utatuzi Center ADR week. And uh, we, the reason that this conversation is quite exciting for us is because um, as we have engaged in mediation, it continues to be clear to us that our job is not settlement agreements. Our job is not settlement agreements as mediators. As mediators, our job is not a document known as settlement agreements. Our job is to transform the conflicts so that people can be able to move on. And that has continued to be just a very big question mark, which um, uh, for, uh, for us as Wasiliana Hub, and it excites us that um, we are uh, in this journey now with uh, the Catholic University of Eastern Africa, just looking into how can we be able to have the professional mediator shift from just being a settlement agreement writer or drawer, because anyone can do that. But really just looking into the future, looking into the relationships and causing the parties who are in dispute to be able to um, shift to another paradigm and also at the same time, the relationship that they, they do have and also the dispute that they have. So I really thank you all for joining in this conversation. We hope that it has been resourceful. It has been extremely resourceful to us. Um, Alena, we thank you for uh, dedicating yourself to take us through. Key takeaways on my part are on two things. Uh, one is that we can actually be creative as mediators and that I've got from um, Alena's presentation. As she was going through the um, insight wheel, we can actually be creative. The questions that she pointed out when she was giving the, the case studies, those are actually questions that we can play with in our mediation chambers. And I'm saying play with because that's, I mean, now what when we are being creative. The second part, um, which I've got from uh, the presentation by uh, Professor Peter Gishure is on mapping mapping who is supposed to be involved, mapping the goals, mapping the desires. I mean, so, and, and I, as, I, just going back again is with this conversation because conflict transformation continues to be a very big conversation at Wasiliana Hub and we are delighted to uh, continue to engage uh, uh, with uh, mediators uh, within the Wasiliana Hub network and also um, others who are interested is that th we see that there's a great opportunity for us to expand this work and expanding this work is expanding the outcomes. At Wasiliana Hub, we say that we enrich lives by building better. So conflict transformation actually is just one of the ways that we can be able to do this. So once again, Asante Sana uh, to our moderator, uh, Mediator Emerald Videga and uh, Sam Nyamo, congratulations. And uh, thank you for uh, stepping up and yeah, holding on for uh, all the young mediators that we do have. Asante Sana and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vidita Wangari, for your comments. Um, we now proceed to the second roundtable uh, session where we will call upon the rest of the panelists. We'll continue with the panelists that um, are on schedule. 
First, we will uh, call upon Honorable Moses Wanjala. He is a he is a magistrate and a registrar of the Mediation Accreditation Committee at the Office of the Chief Justice and the Judiciary of Kenya. He is also the secretary uh, for the Rules Committee. He holds a master's in law and uh, sustainable international development from the University of Washington. Honorable Anjala, my question to you is, uh, we'll take a two-pronged approach in terms of um, embedding conflict coaching skills in the enrollment of mediators uh, by uh, Kenya's judiciary or MAC uh, in this case, and also in terms of provision for disputants, uh, conflict coaching in the new judiciary uh, rules. How do you see the relevance and how this will play out? How the um, insight approach will play out in terms of this. Thank you. Haribu. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, my apologies, I, I joined uh, a bit late. Uh, I, I thought I would travel to where I stayed before I joined, but I, I delayed. Now, I, I joined when uh, Alina was doing a presentation on the insight wheel. I think I've gotten um, very good uh, points on that. And then Professor Gishura's uh, presentation on conflict transformation. Now, in the judiciary in Kenya, we have been running a quota next mediation program for the last uh, five years. And uh, when we started, I would say it was rudimentary because you, what we, what we really focus on, and I, I know uh, Wangare has pointed that out. We really focus on statistics, we focus on settlement agreements. And unfortunately for our judiciary, in, in, okay, I don't know whether it, it's the same position world over, that statistics, statistics and statistics count. In fact, right now, uh, we, 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 th th there are a few matters we've settled, but you will always be asked how much, how many cases did you settle? How much money did you get out of that? How much money did you re, uh, release back to the to the economy? But we don't look at the the, the, the the relationships that we've been able to restore and the values of those relationships. So uh, we are trying to move uh, away from that, but I can assure you it won't be easy. But yes, I agree that we need to now look at the quality, not just the settlements that come in and how we got them. Listening at uh, Professor Gishure's uh, presentation, we, we, we really focus probably on conflict management and, and, and how, how, how do we resolve these disputes that is here with us and now. But do we then look at the relationships, the root causes of those conflicts? After that, after you've had a settlement and it has been adopted, what uh, uh, is this going to work through to the future? Or is it just something that was resolved for that day, but it is it it, it may come back uh, after a short while. So um, the, the nature of the cases that we handle, I know with the resources that we have and the time, it might not really uh, give us that quality that we would want to just focus on the on the on the on the dispute as it is, and deal with all the root causes of that dispute, the the, the relationships, the people involved, and so on. But there is there is some something we can do, something a little that we can do. We are right now working on some documents that uh, that should help us as a committee uh, to to address the issues of mediation trainers. Um, one of those documents addresses how um, how uh, how uh, how the trainers. What is the content? that uh, the trainers should have when they train their mediators and how should they deliver that course to our mediators. So I think one of the ways to include uh, issues to do with conflict coaching and issues to do with the conflict transformation, issues to do with the quality of the mediators that we have is to have a discussion with our trainers. We make it mandatory that Part of what they include in their training is aspects to do with A, B, C, D. So that the mediators that we eventually accredit have already gone through that form of training. And I will, I'll call on you because I don't know whether you have interacted with these documents because I know the 
they are still in draft form, but they are, they, they, they are proceeding. Because once the Mediation Accreditation Committee adopts that, uh, uh, those documents, then we, sh we should be able to have a discussion with the trainers and to ensure that some of these good aspects in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of training can then be included in their curriculum. Now, on the part of the parties uh, who come to mediation, I know that is tricky because uh, they need to be trained, actually. They need to know how to handle the emotions in the mediation. They need to know to be prepared for the mediation. You know, we spend so much time and resources probably training our mediators. But then how do we prepare the parties for the, for, for, for the mediation? Or how, how do we make them aware what they are going to encounter in the mediation room? Because ours is, a, is, is a partly mandatory in that when we screen and refer your matter to mediation, you must go to the mediation. Now, if I came to court, I never talked to, 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 to the defendant or the other side, we don't see each other eye to eye, then I'm told that is the person you're going to sit with in the same room and have a mediation with them. Then how do I get prepared for that? Sometimes we do not get settlements because the parties who are not prepared. But probably that is a discussion I think we can have. Uh, on the part of the judiciary is a bit tricky to prepare the parties for the conflict, for the, for the mediation or for the, for the dispute resolution. But I think with the concerted uh, discussions with the stakeholders, we, we would probably reach a time where we can have a, a session with the parties so that they are prepared, they are trained, they are psychologically in a position to know that when I go to the mediation, this is what I'd likely go through, and probably this is this is what will be the outcome. So for the for the trainers, I think that is a discussion we robustly engage in after we adopt the, the, the document. Thank you. I hope I've tried to address uh, the, the, the issues that you raised. Thank you so much, Honorable Anjala. Um, we have taken in your comment. Um, we will now have uh, uh, Honorable Caroline Kendagor, who's the uh, Principal Magistrate and Deputy Registrar of the Quarter Next Mediation Secretariat uh, of the Office of the Chief Justice and the Judiciary of Kenya. Uh, Honorable Kendagor, um, kindly let us know in terms of application in the mission strategy of the, the Kenyan Judiciary's Quarter Next Mediation, especially in terms of uh, small claims uh, the small claims court, and also in terms of conflict coaching skills as a resource, um, as a resource that can be employed, uh, who prepares the disputants for court and for mediation, and how can this be um, inculcated into the into the mission and strategy? Thank you, Karibu Sana, Honorable Kenago. Thank you very much, uh, Emerald, and uh, thank you everyone. I'm uh, very excited to join the conversation that we are having today and to have benefited largely from uh, the presentation that was made by uh, Elena and uh, uh, the, the very, uh, and, and, and of course, Reverend, uh, Reverend Peter. And uh, to also look at the, I think I've seen the, the, a number of conversations that have, uh, have been prompted as a result of uh, this presentation. Uh, thank you, Wasiliana Hub, for hosting this forum. Uh, on the question that has particularly been posed and just generally what the judiciary is looking at in terms of uh, the implementation of uh, quarter next mediation and uh, the uh, conversation around uh, uh, what we are having today on uh, uh, insight approach and on, uh, on, on conflict coaching uh, is uh, more, I think, Andre Boangela has already touched quite a bit in terms of uh, the preparation or uh, the, the, the inclination towards uh, a, a harmonized and more improved uh, curriculum that will be applicable for uh, our mediators. And I think he also mentioned about the issue of uh, the mentorship uh, uh, guidelines. And uh, uh, what I would say from uh, the end of now as, as an implementing uh, body is uh, that the, the issue of uh, uh, conflict coaching and, uh, and, and the issue of uh, uh, insight approach is uh, for us is a, is a very spot on conversation and particularly bearing in mind that the litigants that we are getting uh, at the instance to which we are referring them to, 
court annex mediation are uh, disputants that have already lodged their complaints in court in an anticipation that they will have a judge or a magistrate to hear and determine the matter. And uh, at that particular instance, also coming in in a, in a, in a very bruised, uh, bruised nature. Alena, we have a threat in Kenya where, uh, where, where when there are, dis there are disputants, we, uh, we say it in Swahili that tukutane uh, kotini. So uh, at that part, it's a, it's a Swahili reference that just says, uh, let's meet in court, which would uh, generally just give you an overview of uh, the, the kind of uh, culture that we have with regard to uh, conflict, uh, resol uh, the, resol the resolution of conflict. So uh, for, for the matters that have already been filed in court, the parties would generally expect that they would have a judge or a magistrate here and determine their matters. And uh, more largely so that that determination would be in context of uh, 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 the claims as they have presented in their pleadings. And in more so cases, you'll actually find that what they tell us in those pleadings and the documents is very superficial. And the real issues uh, or uh, disputes uh, in issue are those unspoken ones, the unwritten ones that they haven't uh, brought to the fore in, uh, in, in, the, in the pleadings that they present. So because of that, uh, there's a generally an approach of uh, a hide and hide and seek. You don't want to let the other party know uh, so much in your pleadings. You don't want to uh, share any documents that you have. You don't want to uh, give uh, details. You, you more so like would like to bank it for the, uh, for the hearing process. And then now getting to an approach where we are having parties and we are telling them we are referring you to a process that is under the umbrella of the court to a process where we're expecting that you'd sit on a round table as opposed to the Tukutane Kotini expectation that you'd have a judge or a magistrate sit at the front and uh, hear and determine the matter, really calls again now for uh, a, a, a lot in terms of uh, a very delicate balance and again, uh, a heavy expectation on the part of us as the court and next mediation program to be able to give this reassurance to the parties. But at the same time, uh, be able to uh, uh, sort of like resonate with them in terms of the expectations that they have vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the process that we are referring them to. The uh, court annex program that we have is largely annex, but it's, it's, it's actually really mandated. So once we refer them to uh, mediation, it assumes a mandatory nature, which means that uh, in the event that we not necessarily expect of them that they must reach an agreement, but we're telling them that they must submit themselves uh, uh, to the process, so the, the needs and the and the and, and the support that would come in is uh, is, is not something that we can really uh, underestimate, and uh, uh, even just that delicate balance that we then have uh, with the with, with the parties, the shift in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the what I, 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 allow me to just call it the ordinary, but I think I'd like to look at it more like ADR is the ordinary. Uh, so the shift that you are moving from a point of view where uh, you as a party are in control of the matter. You set the hearing dates, you, 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 you decide which documents you are presenting, you decide which parties you are calling. Uh, we now get to a, a, a balance where uh, it is the court that is regulating the process. So we take control of the management of the case. Uh, uh, we, 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 try, we give you a mediator as opposed to uh, uh, the parties selecting a, a mediator by themselves. And then what we have just done um, uh, a little in terms of the cushioning, in terms of the preparation of the disputants uh, uh, before they go to the, the process is uh, we mentioned the cases in court. Uh, we have conversations with them regarding what the mediation process is about, uh, who is the mediator, what happens in regard to the course, uh, what is the code of conduct that these mediators are bound to. So, and, and because we do them, as I mentioned, sometimes it is not very easy to be able to really like sort of uh, go to an intense uh, conversation regarding expectations because it is, it is a very short process. You're only mentioning and the, perhaps at that particular time you're telling parties that your file is among those cases that have been uh, screened uh, for mandatory referral to mediation. And I, 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 I want to imagine like there are so many questions that would be in their minds at that particular time. The questions regarding why my matter, why is it that my, mine out of 100,000 cases have been selected to come for this process? Uh, 
So at that time, and 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 uh, the issue of uh, that you're you're giving them a third party, there are so many questions that cannot all of them cannot be answered during the mention process, and the coaching, uh, the conflict coaching is, uh, is is something that would really sort of like cushion us with regard to. Uh, the, the, the questions on expectations, the questions regarding uh, just how comfortable can I go about this process, the issue of the confidentiality clause that is very important in, uh, in, in, in mediation, just how much can I uh, go in terms of uh, letting the other party know about my case, uh, how comfortable am I uh, even exposing my potential witnesses to the mediation process. Under the practice directions that we have, the parties are allowed to come in with an advocate or a personal representative. So sometimes you even find that the, the mediation process gets very antagonistic uh, because of the, the involvement of these particular uh, people that, we, uh, that come in, not necessarily as disputants, but as personal representatives, and, and uh, perhaps even including the advocates who would be coming in. And when that conflict coaching isn't there, then the issue about expectations, the issues about rights and responsibilities becomes very difficult, uh, especially for the mediator to even handle the mediation process. And generally, uh, just reassurance regarding what would even happen beyond uh, the fact that what if we don't get into a settlement and my matter has to go back to court? What if uh, the other party refuses to come and they, there's a... Uh, an uncompliance that is issued. What if we enter into a settlement agreement? What will happen tomorrow with regard to enforcement? So uh, that, uh, and then again, something else that uh, we also try to sort of just like cushion, uh, but not necessarily uh, what I would say would, would achieve the 100 um, and above percent in terms of what are the, um, is required under conflict coaching is uh, the issue of the case summary where we have the parties just file a case summary and, and we, we, we limit it as much as possible to just them telling us what are their issues in, uh, in dispute and their addresses of service. And then of course, there's the statement of understanding where they uh, sort of like get um, file and agree as, uh, as before uh, the mediator. Uh, in terms of um, uh, post mediation, I think it's, uh, uh, as, as I just went up Emerald, is uh, the question around um, uh, post mediation. We, we do not have a right of appeal in the, in the, under the quarter next uh, uh, mediation practice directions that we have. And uh, uh, the question regarding what would happen beyond the settlement agreement, would, is it going to be enforced like any other judgment or order of the court? Can I uh, get back into an antagonistic uh, process for execution in the event that uh, the other party uh, breaches uh, what they have uh, agreed on? Uh, again, uh, the issue of, uh, uh, of course, embracing technology and just uh, uh, leveraging on it to on, uh, on, on use of mediation, again, is something that um, uh, we're hoping would really be able to uh, benefit from. But uh, again, there are uh, quite a number of issues that would come in with regard to uh, a lot of coaching that would be required uh, on how the parties can particularly benefit from the use of uh, virtual mediation, even then as they, as they go about the, uh, the mediation process. So uh, I think for, it, it, uh, as to just uh, maybe in summary answer your question is that yes, uh, conflict coaching is, uh, comes in very handy uh, in handling expectations. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the, the conflict transformation again, will also quite heavily address uh, issues that we have regarding culture change and then uh, embrace on uh, the use of the alternative dispute resolution mechanisms by uh, uh, parties in dispute and just the, uh, the general uh, sort of like approach or uh, embracing it that it can actually help them to really resolve the, the main issues in dispute as, uh, as between themselves. Then uh, maybe just a, 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 a little comment with regard to mediations that are uh, outside the court, because I, I believe Honorable Angela will be having the conversation regarding the, uh, the rules and just generally uh, what would happen with regard to mediations that are arrived at. Uh, I, I think I would maybe just calling them like outside the court annex, those are settlement agreements that parties will be bringing in uh, for adoption and uh, uh, recognition, ado uh, recognition, adoption, and enforcement is uh, again, uh, this issue about conflict coaching and, uh, and, and conflict, uh, uh, the insight, 
and uh, conflict transformation is uh, something that would uh, uh, really cushion with regard to uh, once we have those uh, that particular uh, rules coming in force on uh, mediations that are arrived at outside the court process. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, allow me maybe as I just wind up to con congratulate Sam Nyamo. Uh, Sam, thank you. I think you, are, uh, you and your team and the young mediators are really the, the people that will help us get a, a very uh, a, a culture change approach with regard to use of ADR. Congratulations again and thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Kendago, for your commentary. Uh, and uh, glad to have you back, Alina. Um, if I could uh, swing back uh, the discussion to you, uh, you've heard from our, uh, our officials from, um, the, the, from uh, the Judiciary of Kenya. And the, the question I would like to ask is, uh, give us a commentary in terms of how this plays out in Canada, what is the landscape in terms of court mediation in Canada and, uh, and how is uh, the insight approach uh, being applied in that case? Uh, thank you so much for uh, everything that you've shared, um, all of the commentary. Um, I really appreciate learning more uh, about what is going on um, in your side of the world. So on, on this end, there are some things that are very similar. So mediation is becoming mandatory for family uh, disputes as well as small court uh, settlements. So anything uh, $5,000 and under now has to go up to mediation um, as a mandatory uh, to free up the space uh, in courts and reduce costs. Um, what, uh, what is happening is it is a similar thing. It is a very official process. Uh, you're not allowed to bring an advocate with you. So it's, it's between the two parties, although in other disputes, you can have a lawyer representing you. So in the small claims court, you can have both parties can have the lawyer representing them in mediation. It can be shadow mediation where the two sides are in separate rooms. And the point of the mediator is just to form um, an agreement and uh, have a document uh, signed by the end of it. And that's kind of the gist of it. Um, a lot of the, um, the family uh, family mediation work does involve more in deciding how parenting time is, especially involving children. It would involve deciding, helping parties decide how parenting time and parenting duties would be split, uh, spousal support, uh, those issues. Uh, that involves more uh, cooperation from the parties, right? But it is also possible. Uh, it's not mandatory yet in uh, all of the jurisdictions here in BC where I am. Uh, some of the cities are, um, are uh, adopting it as a mandatory process to go to mediation instead of uh, going straight to court. Uh, again, because the costs of litigation have risen so, so much, um, it bankrupts families, right? It, it takes away the resources. So to, to save the money to the families and save on the, le uh, the legal processes and free up the courts, uh, mediation is becoming more mandated, but it is also uh, necessary to have uh, more mediators. So it's not a process that can be, uh, that is happening overnight. Um, the government is ramping up uh, their uh, roster of mediators that work then with the government within the system. And there is also private mediators. So there is government appointed mediators and private mediators uh, who are more um, self-governed in a group uh, that work with experience and within their own associative uh, certifications that work with that field. And again, it's um, the goal is to come out with an agreement that the parties can then sign and adhere to, to avoid uh, going to court. Uh, the clients that I work with, I find that um, they, they come to me because they have a desire to, to have more than just an agreement. They, they need more work in not finding the, the more collaborative uh, path forward. But there's also changes in the legal field itself uh, with collaborative law. 
So collaborative lawyers, they, what the way I see that they're a, they're a blend between the mediators and the lawyers that would traditionally be out to get kind of the most for their um, for their party that they're representing, and they're seeking collaboration collaboration with the other side, right? And insight collaborative lawyers, so collaborative lawyers using insight, they're really um, a fascinating blend between a mediator and a lawyer where they are asking the curious questions. So as they're working with parties in conflicts, the approach that they choose to take, even working within the parameters of their policies and what they have to fit within um, their profession, they still manage to have their own mindset in rooted in curiosity. So they're not telling parties, okay, this is what you want to do to get the best result. They're asking, right, what it is. And it is quite similar to interest base, right? Like what are the interests um, and how do we achieve win-win, but also the questions that they ask, the more inside base, they're gaining insights in the parties, um, ideas and thoughts and what's guiding them to help to help them come to that agreement with a goal that that agreement is easier to implement right and it's when the parties agree to something that they really feel ownership of um there there will be less uh, policing on the other end thank you so much for that commentary elena um i'd like to call upon uh, medita sam and a brief commentary on uh, quarter next mediation um, and uh, its relevance. Oh, um, thank you so much, Mediator Emerald. Um, so I just had an interesting learning moment, uh, very relevant to this, this conversation. Um, so when I was prepping for the session, I was actually coming, I was actually attacking the uh, Mediation Accreditation Committee and the Nairobi Center of International Arbitration um, on behalf of young mediators, because um, as uh, I, Honorable Angela did mention that in, in this field, statistics are everything, how many cases and how many cases are you mediating? And I know that to be accredited um, by Mac, you need to have at least handled three uh, or, or at least observed or be involved in three mediations. And for the Nairobi Center of Arbitration, I think it's about five. And I had, I had a bit of a problem actually in the genesis of my, my, my career as a mediator in that to be accredited, you need, you need to have handled those three to five matters. And I, I, I felt like the question that was never addressed is as a fresh mediator, where are you getting these five cases, right? Because um, yes, there's the training institutions and, and they are supposed to offer mentorship, but there are also so many students that you find most times young mediators stay a year post-qualification and they haven't gotten a chance to even handle one case that can get them closer to accreditation. So today I was actually going to implore not just Mac, but also the Nairobi um, Center of International Arbitration that, the, that even when we are, and I'm actually very glad, I'm very glad that at least this was a conversation that was already happening in the judiciary. Uh, and that's what actually made me relax my defenses. I felt my, my, my interests were threatened and after, uh, Honorable Kendago also spoke, my defenses relaxed because I listened to her and I got to realize that what I thought I knew is not the full picture. Uh, so that was my, my learning moment there. But yes, I'd like to implore both the bodies that um, even in considering, in, in considering their appointments, whenever they're assigning matters to me, uh, senior mediators, I think it would also play a very major role if they attached um, freshly trained mediators from the different institutions, because um, obviously there's, there's a roster of um, mediators who are trained, freshly trained. So it would really go a long way if whenever a case is assigned by the judiciary, 
they make it a responsibility upon, uh, or rather they pair a young mediator with a senior mediator in, in order to give them that observation, that, 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 that um, chance to, 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 to learn the skill because mediation is skill-based and it gets better with practice, right? So if we, 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 we pair young mediators with senior mediators, I think we can also uh, ensure that we have good quality practitioners out there because um, the judiciary also has a has a um, has an observatory um, role, I guess, in making in preserving the integrity of the profession. And if um, we are saying that uh, uh, young mediators, after they are freshly trained, we are pairing them with already accredited mediators who have, um, for instance, gone through the conflict coaching skills and the entire, the, the, in accordance to the, the new rules that are coming out and so on, the curriculum and all that. It means that even the quality of the young mediators is going to match up to the seniors. And that way we have uniformity within the practice. Um, I think that was, that was my, major, my major comment in regards to that session. Thank you so much for that comment, Mediator Sam. Um, we will now proceed to uh, Victoria Keegan, from, uh, who is a case counsel at the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration. Uh, she is also an avid international arbitrator, uh, arbitration practitioner, and a Kenyan lawyer. Um, Victoria, we would like to um, hear from you in terms of application to arbitration and also what has been your experiences in the provision of NCIA's services to the public, the government, and also to its advisors. And of course, now, what is the relevance of the insight approach to it? Karibu. Um, thank you so much, Rasiliana Hub, for hosting this insightful and educative symposium. I have actually been, uh, at some point I, I got lost, but I came back, but I've thoroughly enjoyed the proceedings, uh, the presentations by Alina, by Reverend Professor Peter, even the comments by Wangari, Sam, and uh, by Honorable Kendagor and Honorable Anjala. So maybe let me just answer Sam's question and then I go ahead. So Sam has uh, raised a very important conversation that we, are, we have actually been grappling with at the NCIA in terms of um, uh, accrediting people to um, our mediators, uh, especially now that we have been receiving applications to, of those people who have not had a chance to have experience in five mediations. And we have been thinking of, uh, particularly about a mentorship program that would be helpful to young arbitrators, the up, up and coming, those, those who have not, not, those who have experience, but that, those are that not relevant at the particular instance. So uh, that is a conversion that is ongoing right now. And uh, as soon as we have created like an outline or the rules of application by our training committee, then we will have that in public, but for sure, we will have young arbitrators attached to, young mediators and arbitrators attached to uh, experienced one, particularly when in those ongoing cases. Now, um, when I want to speak, okay, actually, let me just mention, I have a master's in international arbitration law uh, from the University of Miami, but in the same master's degree, I also have experience in, in mediation. That's why I, I was very uh, excited when I was invited to participate in this forum. So when it comes to um, the use of insight approach that has been mentioned, uh, that's something that I had not really, really, I think it's a new thing in the market that is, uh, or it has been in the market, but I have not really had it being practiced in Kenya. And as my preceding uh, presenters have mentioned that it's something that we need to consider, particularly in training um, our practitioners especially in the not, not only in mediation practice but also in arbitra in arbitration practice because uh even in as much as arbitration is a process whereby it seems kind of like an adversarial system whereby uh, the arbitrator listens to the case and at the end of the day makes a judgment or what it's usually called an award but eventually an arbitrator would want to delight in uh, maintaining relationship between the parties even if most of the time it would not end that way 
but I think the insightful approach, insight approach would be um, something to, to look at and uh, probably um, train domestic and international practitioners in ADR and in arbitration uh, to focus on that. Now, um, at NCIA, we handle different kinds of cases and most of, the, most of the cases actually our mandate is to handling commercial cases. So the cases that we've been able to handle so far, particularly in arbitration have been, even in mediation as well, have been commercial disputes either between a, a government institution and a private uh, party or even between two private parties. So long as you, you either have a, an arbitration or a mediation clause that mention NCIA as, as your institution of choice in particular in, in, in respect to administration of your dispute, and if even even the party if, if the parties do not have such a clause and a dispute has arisen and they desire to have the same dispute administered at the NCIA, we have a, a, a standard clause that we usually give the parties. We're like, okay, if you're interested in this, then you sign this particular contract between the two parties and you come, we'll administer your dispute. So that is some we we always believe in party autonomy, whether it is arbitration or mediation. And that is what we think any out of court processes should be agreed between the parties. So, um, and mediation cases actually recently we've been receiving a lot of mediation cases. Um, but I remember there's a big, there's a, one of the biggest cases we've received in mediation, the, the dispute, um, uh, the amount in dispute was 5 billion Kenya shillings. So, but now you can see it is commercial. So that's why we have a problem. We have not received so much of family law cases. So, so that when we receive applications from parties, uh, from, from mediators to join our panel, they may have family law experience. But we think in the, in the future, we'd, we would gladly desire to have family law disputes because when it comes to solving disputes in, um, in, in, in Kenya or anywhere, you don't want to say, oh, here we don't solve this kind of disputes. But, but since our inception or receiving our first case in 2017, we are we have we have real actually we have actually never received any family law cases and probably maybe it's because not many people are aware of NCIA or rather even if mostly in family law disputes you don't find parties to have a co contract beforehand and that's why you find these family law disputes being channeled to the judiciary whom we work hand in hand with. And uh, in the previous couple previous months we've been able to also work uh, in the same breath with Wasiliana Hub. So um, I like the conversation and I think uh, since NCA has also started uh, its training curriculum in mediation and arbitration, it's, it's a conversation to have with the stakeholders like Wasiliana Hub and the judiciary to come up with a training curriculum that is sufficient for all the participants, uh, especially with this aspect. This actually is, I've really, I have really thought about it because when Elena mentioned about um, in the mediation process, you ask you ask questions more than you more than you you know you give points. I realized that most mediators usually end up giving ideas. They don't ask questions so that parties would end up coming up with the settlement agreement. And Wangari has mentioned something very important. The the end game for mediation is not just to come up with a settlement agreement. It's actually to 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 maintain the relationship of the parties. So, um, and in arbitration, I feel like in as much as it's a, it's a catch 22 situation, but it would be ideal to have a, a situation whereby parties relationships are maintained. So far, so good uh, in those arbitration disputes that we have seen from the beginning to the end at NCIA, they, we have not had any challenges in court on the award. It means that the parties were satisfied with the, with the, with the, with the arbitration decision. Same applies to the mediation cases we've had at NCIA. And we are hoping that, uh, we are hoping that in this collaborative aspect, we are able to guide Kenya into uh, a, a, a similar and a, and a seamless approach towards the practice of ADR, mediation, arbitration, and all these ADR processes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Victoria, for that commentary. Um, I'd like to invite our mediator, Catherine Waroe, who is a counseling psychologist, an addiction specialist, and a certified professional mediator. 
Mediator Catherine, uh, kindly speak to us in terms of application to mediation when dealing with special situations and needs and personality types. For example, um, when you're dealing with a situation where alcoholism is involved. Thank you. Welcome. We will, we will proceed to mediator Margaret Njenga, who's a chief mediator and a vocational director at Wasiliana Hub. And um, my question to you is in terms of uh, community mediation. How do you see the insight approach in terms of application to uh, meeting the needs of the communities and also development of community mediators and uh, community mediation practice in general? excited to be part of this forum hello hello can you hear me hello proceed, proceed. We, we, can can hear you. Now. we can hear you hello proceed we can hear you hello hello proceed we can hear you You can hear me. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. My name is Margaret Jenga. And um, what what we do? What we do? Uh, for me, I I deal with the community mediation. I visit the chiefs camps. In particular, I have one one camp that um, leaded uh, attached to in one of the slums in Nairobi, and most of the times when I'm not busy, I walk there. That is where I and uh, we deal with people who are uh, less less fortunate. And one of the things that we do is to understand the kind of living that they, 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 they are living and the challenges that they have in their, the kind of life that they... Uh, we try to understand the, their living styles and when they come, you don't, you, you don't judge them. You, you listen to understand their matter, not listening to answer what, what, what you think you should answer. And... Um, there are so many challenges in the slums. And when you when you walk there and think that you can solve their problems without uh, engaging with them, uh, you'll get the shock of their life. Because one, they think that you are from a well up family and you cannot you cannot uh, uh, interact with them. First we walk through the slums. We, we walk to their doors and trying to find out what are their challenges, what are their, what, 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 uh, what problems they go through. And uh, if we try to help them in terms of uh, uh, listening to their challenges, listening to their problems. And in most cases, they tend to listen to you and uh, at least come up with, with kind of solutions. I'm happy that uh, this year I've been able to, I've been, I've been able to uh, 
to sort out to three families and we have been able to to make agreements and not only the agreements the families coming together and uh, in actual fact uh, i really enjoy being in in the slums thank you Thank you so much, uh, uh, Margaret, for now um, the commentary on community mediation. Um, Elena, do you have any commentary on those? Yes, um, thank you so much um, for all of the for all of the thoughts and ideas. And what I'm really liking is hearing how Thing, how it applies in the variety of contexts of your work, uh, whether it's uh, with the people who are living in the slums of Nairobi to the people who are coming through the judicial system. Um, the insight applies to everybody because we are all people, we all have feelings, and all these feelings are valid and true. And helping us as practitioners uh, have a guiding have a guiding light, have a guiding thought on what am I doing when I'm helping people in conflict? What am I thinking? What am I asking? Maybe why am I asking this? What is the goal of my questions and my presence here? It can then help us operate within the parameters that we find our job brings us to, right? So whether it's an official process where there is not much room for creativity it can still help you guide your questions or help you remind you that um, you can ask more questions than give answers or whether it's more of an informal setting with people where you're on the streets and you're helping bring families together it's a different environment but the goal is the same and the questions the, the purpose of the questions is the same as what can i do to help these people find the answers because coming in as a practitioner we don't have the answers people are the people are the experts in their own lives they know what matters to them they know what they're capable of and like uh, was mentioned before that they might not be willing to share everything and open up deeply in the room with uh, with the people that they have a conflict with right but that means that we don't have all the information that they have on their own experience and their abilities. So coming in with a curiosity and having that respect for their experience and using curious questions to help them find the solutions that will work for them uh, can really help in, um, in the variety of contexts like everybody mentioned. So thank you so much for your insights and for the connections that you've made with this. Thank you so much, Elena. Uh, Mediator Sam, any insight on that commentary? Um, I I definitely think, uh, what's this? I, I agree with Mediator and Jenga in terms of the use of the insights approach in mediation, in community mediation, because especially if you're dealing with um, sensitive issues, because uh, some of those issues, uh, community mediation is probably refer to the neighborly relations, family matters, there, there could be a lot at play and um, feelings and emotions are heightened. So what I noticed, I'm comparing now the facilitative uh, approach uh, to mediation, you'd find that uh, when you're having a session with parties and you realize that there's a touchy topic that every time you touch on, it heightens emotions. Um, what you'd tend to do as a mediator is shy away from that topic and table it last for you to at least set a foundation of agreement before you get to that sensitive topic. And as opposed to insight mediation, where um, I, I liked when Elena said, uh, in, in, in the insight approach, when you strike a nerve or you notice that this is a very sensitive area for the parties, instead of shying away from it, you focus on it because um, it means that where there's, um, through feelings, we learn that there's something important at play. And that could be the root cause of the entire 
entire dispute, right? So I think definitely inside, uh, inside the insight approach has a great role it plays and it could be very impactful in community mediations. Thank you again, uh, Migita Sam, for that um, commentary. Um, as we draw to a close, I would like to request um, Reverend Professor Peter Gishuri to give us some closing remarks um, on the insight approach and tying it with uh, the conflict transformation paradigm. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, uh, a lot has been said and the uh, positive things about what can happen here in Kenya. I, what I want to say is that we have to be very sensitive to our culture. Our culture is that people are very communitarian. We have got the Ubuntu or, or, uh, and we, we do not want to exclude others. And uh, every time uh, we, there's a dispute, uh, the people will always uh, feel bad that they, they are not in the relationship. So the insight uh, approach uh, can be adopted to our situation here. And we try to understand where other people are coming from, understand ourselves as mediators, so that we can be able to uh, bring a lasting solution to dispute. Because unlike the, the Western world where people, the individualism uh, takes center stage, here, communitarian life is very, very vital. And again, also to say that uh, the issue regarding uh, conflict transformation uh, is something that can be at the, by, at the back of the mind of the mediator. And when the opportunity presents itself, the mediator can be able to bring it to the fore. And then lastly, we, we also need to know that we, are, we need to go to the academia to, to start learning seeing whether we can be able to have ongoing information, learning about these new insights, uh, transformation that can make our work much better and quality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Um, closing remarks from uh, our young mediator, uh, mentee of the month, Sam. Thank you. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to say thank you to all our speakers for being with us here today and also affording me this great opportunity to serve as one of your uh, moderators and be part of this very insightful discussion today. I believe I've come to realize that dispute resolution is a calling in itself, a call of which I answered a couple of years ago and I can proudly say today that I'm still enjoying the conversation. Um, my view of conflict behavior has definitely changed. Before this session, I viewed conflict as a struggle over claims, resources, incompatible interests and needs. But today I learned conflict behavior is a defense against a perceived threat. Once the threat is removed, parties relax and a more productive conversation can be had despite of the differences. Or put differently, if you don't have to fight me, you, you can listen to me. If you can listen to me, you can change your mind about me. That has been my biggest takeaway from, from uh, this session. Uh, Elena, I want to thank you personally and on behalf of my future clients, because they're definitely going to benefit from this approach, uh, for facilitating the session and giving us a different perspective to how we view conflict resolution. Honorables Wanjala, Honorable uh, Kindago, and my senior arbiter, Victoria Keegan, I want to thank you so much for your time and input um, to this discussion. And I, I must say, it is, I, I feel so much better now um, being aware that uh, this wasn't just a grievance I had, it's something that the judiciary and the Nairobi Center of uh, International Arbitration were already working on. And I can't wait and I look forward to it because I know very many other young mediators are waiting for such opportunities. Um, 
mediator Warui and Jenga, as well as Reverend Gishuri. It has been an aura, it, it, it has been an honor, sorry, to also serve in your presence. And I want to thank you all, as well as Wasiliano Hub and the convening team for having me today. And I hope you all have an amazing evening. Thank you, Mediator Sam. Um, finally, I would like to call upon Mediator Wangari for closing remarks before we proceed. Um, I, I think uh, we, this is a discussion that we probably should uh, uh, prolong and extend. It's just that it's uh, evening now, and also we had uh, requested for uh, the, 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 the time just to keep to it. This, the time we are on right now is our clubhouse time, so we are still in good time for this session. For this session. But um, uh, I think one of the things that delights me is, is, is when we are able to expand on the work or the approaches that mediators can be able to take on so that we can be able to deliver sustainable outcomes. That continues to be the, you know, just the resounding that we must be able to approach this work from an area of sustainability. As I said earlier, because we are not in the business of generating settlement agreements that has been done before, it continues to be done and anyone can do it. Yes, it is uh, part of the process, but I think we really have something else extra. And um, I thank you, Alena, for helping us to just uh, understand probably what we've been grappling with on, on one part. And also, uh, uh, Professor Peter Gishure, I thank you for continuing to expand our conversation on conflict uh, transformation. Um, to our to all our 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 our, our roundtable speakers, um, one uh, please note that we had um, some very some the, actually the very key people at the judiciary um, who are uh, in charge and involved with the work of mediation. We do not take this for granted. It was a very very deliberate invitation because we as as we have said that we are clear that this is not work that is done by just one person. We are looking for collaborators. And if on your sides you need collaborators, I mean, Wasiliana Hub community is a very open community that seeks to collaborate because we are on the same mission. The colleagues, the peers who are on this conversation, on this call, they have learned a lot. I mean, if called upon, they would be excited and delighted to be able to just chime in and give their, their input and views to the judiciary to be able to support the work that you're doing and also that to a body like NC, the NCIA and uh, also to the vice versa. Yet again, also to institutions like the universities where we have um, a, a lot of the learning and especially also the a great need for research um, around what is uh, relevant. Even like listening to now the tangent that uh, Professor Gishure did come from. He came from, oh, who are we? Because that's, as, as, as a university comes from um, a research mind first before we start um, being able to develop. Uh, Mediator Emerald, who's been uh, our moderator, I really thank you because you have journeyed us through this and also most of all for preparing this session. Um, for everyone who's on this call, uh, probably she started preparing this session six months ago and this is when it's being served. Um, and so we really thank you. Um, uh, our young um, mediator, uh, Sam Nyamo, hi, how are you today? <laughs> I'm great. I've had such a great session. <laughs> you know, I've been listening to your, your comments and I'm like, what? In, I mean, you know, it's just in just the, the, the time that it has taken to prepare this session, I mean, just the growth that has been there for you. And it's really just to encourage and also just to challenge um, young mediators. I do appreciate that, you know, when you get into this work, you're like, oh, they need five, they need 10. But guess what? You can create your own tangent. You can create your own path. And then the rest of us will actually be following that path. I mean, we are looking forward to a write-up from um, uh, Sam, uh, uh, mediator Sam after this particular session. From there, he's now started to write about this work. You know, I mean, he's been a speaker, he's been a moderator. So we really encourage you that you can actually be able to um, take this work into any, I mean, the tangent, what really serves you and excites you. Um, the people who started the insight approach were thinking creatively. So if that's the, the angle that you come from, you really can do uh, create this work in any direction. Uh, Morenike, I thank you for 
uh, bringing to us um, the other angle from um, Africa, um, from Nigeria, and also um, also just chiming in on your expertise in the ODR uh, field. Um, uh, mediators uh, Patricia Ketch and also uh, mediator um, uh, Margaret Njenga, I thank you because the uh, conversation that you bring in, we are the ones who are on the ground and you help us to be able to appreciate, to, to, to get to know in terms of let's like how best to be able to adopt some of these uh, ways so that we can be able to serve uh, much better. I know we've not been able to hear from uh, mediator Catherine Warue, who is also one of the masterclass leads together with uh, uh, mediator Patricia Ketch, but I thank, um, I thank her also for having joined into the conversation. So Asante Nisana and may God bless you and back again to you uh, mediator uh, Emerald. And after this, we have sent the link to Clubhouse on the chat. Please use it so that you can be able to join. And yeah, at Clubhouse, we'll be there until 10 p.m. clubbing. So please join the young mediators. Happy hour there. God bless you and have a good the rest of the day. Asante. Thank you so much, mediator Wangari. Uh, much has been said. Um, I really don't have much to add to that, except a big thank you um, to all of you ladies and gentlemen who have been uh, with us today and have um, uh, been patient and uh, quite generous in um, involving yourselves in this discussion and participating in the discussion and chiming in with all your comments um, and uh, not losing patience and being with us to this time, uh, despite the time uh, having extended. Um, I also want to extend a very big thank you to our facilitator for the day, Alena Asashenkawa. I believe I've mentioned that properly. <laughs> yes. Okay. So uh, very excited. I've learned a new way of saying the name. So um, very excited uh, for what you have shared with us today. Such an insightful approach to uh, conflict. Um, and uh, you have imparted in us an, a wealth of knowledge. Uh, and just as everybody who's spoken before me has said, this is quite something that we need to uh, look into uh, and uh, think through and also uh, in, uh, include it in um, the conflict narrative as we move forward. Um, mediator Sam, uh, as mentioned, uh, thank you so much for co-moderating uh, the session with me. You have made it exceptionally interesting. Uh, most of your commentary has been very thought provoking to uh, most of the people here um, and uh, food, you've given most of us food for thought. And so that has also been very exciting to be part of. Um, I would like to point out at this point that we will be having another session with uh, um, on the 24th of uh, June. I've put it up on the screen there. This will be the second session of the Wasiliana Hub Quarter 2 Virtual Mediation Day Symposium for the year 2021. And it will be on the Naivasha uh, Proposed Judiciary Court Annex Mediation Rules for the year 2020. And we will be graced uh, by the Honorable Wanjala uh, again. And uh, the session is dubbed Ask Me Anything. So kindly diarize this session and uh, register. The link is already up on the Wasiliana website. Kindly register as soon as possible and prepare and schedule to attend for that one. We hope that it will be as informative as this one. And with that, um, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to a close of the session. And uh, thank you so much for being here. Let us see each other at uh, Clubhouse where the party continues, as uh, Mediator Wangari has said. Thank you. Bye.